Next, next in. in. Boom, we're here. Welcome to Next In. It is March 11th when we are recording. And yeah, I know Richard has to look around like, wait, March 11th? I know. In this there world we where sometimes we're working from home, we're like, wait. And by the way, it's Friday. I don't know if you did not realize that. it was a Friday. I thought today was Wednesday. Quite literally, oh, I, I got the team going, but I'm got the weekend tomorrow. I was like, no, you don't. Really, <laughs> I know. really March? hyped about it being a Friday. Yeah, did not know it was March. I was like, huh, March, February. Oh, okay. Here we are. <laughs> February is a short month. There you go. Mm-hmm. It's 2020, right? We just hit that year. <laughs> yes, 2020. <laughs> Guess what's about to come? Two years of lockdowns. Great. Um, so no, it's 2022. And uh, we are blessed, honored to have Richard Hain, the lead producer with Counterplay Games, a uh, huge studio, worldwide studio. Um, and we'll talk about games and everything else. So obviously I'm joined with Shane Chown uh, and myself, Taylor Duncan. We lead Next Level, a recruiting agency that works pretty heavily in the gaming space and everything technology. And full transparency for everyone we have a pretty good relationship with Richard, so he is he is a, a friend of ours, so we appreciate him coming on the show. We love talking gaming, and we'll get into some of that. So we have a lot of people who tune into this, and they listen for, maybe it's for product advice, or it's software advice, or it's gaming advice, or it's a little bit of all. I think one of the most fun things, at least for them to hear, that I've heard the feedback is hearing the story, how, they, how you got to where you're at, because you realize it is not a linear path for almost any. It's always got some unique twists and turns. So again, counterplay games. If you guys are unfamiliar, very you know more famous even now for PlayStation Five exclusive Godfall, which is just an amazing game. And um, there, yep, there it is. And uh, so pretty exciting uh, how you got there, but it obviously has not been a linear path for you. So Richard, how would you get to the position you're at? Tell us a little of your story. Yeah, I mean, you you set it up great with unique twists and turns. So I'll try to power through and not bore with any particular details. But where would I start? So um, I first met Keith, the CEO of Counterplay, back when I was in Normal, Illinois. Um, uh, I was uh, I attended Illinois State University, studied communication, uh, got my master's in that, and then spent two years teaching at Illinois State University, teaching communication courses. And while I was doing that, I stumbled upon a game called Duelist that that now uh, you know some some folks might be familiar with. Um, awesome little card game on Steam, free to play, and I immediately fell in love with it. Uh, and it came at a very interesting time in my life because uh, I was I was I suppose reaching a point of maturity where I. Th- I think maybe we all have this point as, as gamers as you as you as you grow up like i was i was questioning whether or not gaming was going to be for me long term i'd like like it, it, not that it had gotten stale or anything like that but i i just felt like i was in a, in a rut so to speak like games just weren't hitting the same way and i was like oh no is this is this the growing up thing that everyone talks about oh no it's <laughs> happening um so i found duelist and it, it it pulled me out of that funk actually in a lot of ways so i, I fell in love with it at the time my, my my girlfriend now fiance uh gabriella she was starting to uh like ease her way into esports she was really intrigued by that started streaming very much on the amateur level and so I, I felt inspired like by, she was doing a lot of content things so i was like i'm gonna make youtube videos for duelists because i love duelists it was just so much fun I, and i know how to video edit so why not and so naturally the first thing i did was because I, I guess uh, not out of laziness but out of i was just like i'm gonna i'm gonna email the, the counterplay and i'm just gonna ask them for free stuff because then i can make cool content with free stuff and then they get videos out of it so like how could they ever turn me down so i emailed keith directly i like kind of stalked him a little bit and found his email address i was like can i just have like a bunch of packs of cards so i can open them on my <laughs> my channel and sure enough i mean he was really nice about it he was great he's like yeah with your you've seen some of your earlier content love it you're great so he did it and uh from there i started hosting uh amateur tournaments just for fun in my free time um and, and my fiance actually cast them at the time which is so funny because now she's on the league of legends lcs broadcast la tigris as their host interviewer and caster so in some ways you know i scouted some like pretty big esports talent back in the day yeah I, there I, you I, go I can, I can maybe take a little credit <laughs> no i shouldn't um but anyway so i was hosting these amateur tournaments they're really high quality obviously i had incredible talent so um you know, Keith saw that and he's like, we love what you do at Counterplay. Can you just work for us part time and start hosting our tournaments for us? And I was like, 
yeah, do you want to pay me to do this thing on Zoom for free anyways? Like, sure, hell yeah, I'd love that. <laughs> yeah. Make something versus nothing is always better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, sounds good to me. No, no You're like back the of mine. unofficial it's... community manager at the beginning almost, right? That, that was kind of it. I mean, they had a community manager at the time who was much more focused on forms, feedback, reporting, you know, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, they, like we, and, and so we, we, we created the Duelist World Championship um, basically from scratch. It was like a nine to 12 month long process um it, like ended up we were on the front page of twitch for a bunch of the different installments it actually went extremely well we we did a lot with a little also we worked with mega mogwai who is an incredible talent now works on legends of Ruterra with riot so we were really kind of punching above our weight for this like small little indie card game we were really kind of crushing it so we we, we reached the end of that eventually duelist partnered with bandai namco they took over marketing which included tournaments uh naturally so keith kind of reached out to me at that point after being with counterplay for about a year and was like hey listen we're going to transition we're working on this new unannounced project uh what would ultimately come to be godfall and he's like you know at the time we're obviously a small indie studio still we're probably only about 20 or so people really i mean they had started hiring internally for godfall a little bit but we really hadn't scaled up in any significant manner at the time so he reached out he's like hey we we, we think you're organized we like you uh no this is kind of new kind of out of uh, out of the blue a little bit but like do you want to be our producer and like you'll you'll work closely with emil and i and and we'll we'll figure this thing out together and, and you know i was transparent with him i was like i just accept, I accepted this teaching job i have like another six months of that um, I would love to. I trust you guys, and I'm, I'm excited to learn from you guys. But also, you know, as you mentioned, like no previous ex previous experience. Like this is going to be my first production title, um, so maybe some patience required there. But I'm hungry. I'm competitive. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm all in. Like if, if if you believe in it, then I believe in it. So that was kind of where the journey started. And for the first two years of pre production on Godfall, I was I was the only producer. It was like me and those guys, <laughs> and and we were building the team from scratch. I was learning as I went, and it was an incredible experience. I mean. I I got day to day to work with engineers. They would like teach me how to build things in engine. Not that I needed to know how, but they're like, let me explain to you my process and then let me get you dialed into that, which, you know, now in hindsight, many years later, I'm, I'm so grateful for because it really laid a strong foundation for kind of what I believe a good producer is. Um, and then, yeah, basically after two years, we, we hired someone, Mateo, who's an incredible lead producer. He joined the team and that was just kind of another mentor for me. Somebody who came from outside of the counterplay ecosystem had worked on some incredible, um, um, uh, AAA titles prior to joining counterplay and was able to kind of level me up in that sense. Like, you know, I was very much in the counterplay ecosystem. I understood how we did things, but I had very limited exposure to the industry outside of that. So Mateo was a huge boon to my, my own personal growth, um, around the time that he joined joined i ramped up pretty quickly to senior level started taking on more responsibilities um and, and then yeah like we after a successful launch of godfall and, and several releases later we've had our major fire and darkness expansion we've had multiple huge free dlcs we have another one coming up uh, pretty pretty soon here um you know you know here i am today and and it's just been kind of a, an amazing journey like you said with lots of unique twists and turns and definitely kind of an unconventional start for sure so I'm curious as to like, what do you believe? Because obviously Keith took a massive leap of faith and he's just like, hey, I found this like unique talent that is like hosting these events. They're running now our events. Now it's now this thing is booming. And it's just like, you know, you help kind of like set the foundation for some of the stuff with Duelist before um, it, it got kind of taken over by a, a publisher. And then now you've helped with, uh, you know, Godfall. Why do you think that leap of faith to becoming a producer was even able to happen, right? Because there's a lot of people that have experience in the gaming industry, right? They might be in QA, they might be in gameplay, they might be in art, they might be in design, they could be all over the place. But like, you know, no experience in going into a producer role is pretty crazy if you think about it right so yeah i, I mean I, you know to, to, to some degree you'd probably have to ask keith himself because it's a question that i ask myself very it's even to this day i'm like why the hell did he do that like what are we i mean i guess at the end of the day like i was i was probably a little low risk like i was very i was very mature very professional so you know worst case i, I kind of stink and you know whatever uh so so maybe, maybe in some respect it was it was low risk but i i mean i do think i had uh solid fundamentals coming into it and i i, I reflect on this a lot because also in, in gaming industry and in many other industries i'm sure you know imposter syndrome is a real thing and and when you come at it from my perspective where it's like i have no prior experience it, it is something that i've i've grappled with for sure um uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, I, what I've come to terms with is I had solid fundamentals. I mean, one thing that's uh, little known about me, because it's not like on a LinkedIn or anything, but I'm an Eagle Scout. So I, I've been, you know, a, a practiced leader my entire life. And I've, I've always 
valued that skill set. And I, I think that's kind of core to being a good producer anyways. Um, and I've also always wanted to be a game developer. I've always been in, like, I've always kind of like been intrigued and, and, and motivated to learn engines, to learn like how other departments do it. I, I'm not very artistically inclined and, and I'm by no stretch of the imagination an amazing, an amazing coder, but all of those things really interest me. And I love learning about the craft. Um, so I just think, you know, my, my solid fundamentals as a leader and then my willingness to just aggressively learn and, and put myself out there and, and, and fail graciously, um, I, I think gave some early signs of like, Hey, this, you know, this guy might be, he might be something. Um, and, and, and also I'm just hyper competitive. I'm, I'm really, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I did competitive speech and debate for eight years, both in high school and college. It's how I paid for college. It's how I paid for grad school. It was all for full rides. Uh, so just at, at my core, um, I, I refuse to lose <laughs> it, it, like it, it, in a healthy way, of course. I mean, there is there is a balance there. Right. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm you know, I, I always make it really clear, like I'm ride or die. I'm extremely loyal. I'm extremely competitive. And and I think those are really attractive traits when you're thinking of you know, somebody who you want to build a team with. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's <clears throat> frankly, that's arguably exactly what we look for as we look to build our team. So actually, if you're looking for a job. Oh, boy. Um, oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but in, in, in reality, <clears throat> you know, I think it's a it's a skill that can be really transferable in a lot of different space. Obviously, we're in the recruiting side. So we're in the talent acquisition side. You're not. You're in the gaming space very specifically as a producer. But that competitiveness and that drive to win, I believe really can translate to a lot of different aspects, even probably in the coding space, someone who has that competitiveness to eat, to meet and exceed budgets or get it done faster, get it done better, et cetera. <clears throat> How do you think that it has helped you as a producer? Now, not, you know, for us, we, we have kind of that sales forward mindset. It, I think it's a little bit easy to understand where competitiveness, but from your, your space of being in the producer, you know, how do you see that competitiveness has helped you be successful? It, it's hard to be a good qualitative producer in, in the sense that, you know, something I learned early on is I, I remember being on early environment calls or animation calls and, and somebody like Keith or Emil, who far more experienced than me have, have a far better eye for this stuff, especially at the time, you know, they, I would see an animation. I'd be like, wow, good job, guys. I'm very impressed by your ability to execute. And then Emil would be like, I have like a, like a page worth of notes of issues, it, it, you know, in, in a polite way, but he, he had that eye for it. So I, I acquiring that skill and being a good qualitative producer, isn't something that match that, that comes natural, especially if you're working with departments that you, like, if you haven't previously animated, it's hard to have an eye for it. So I think where being competitive played a role is I, I learned that very quickly. And I was like, if I'm going to be good at this, if I'm going to be the best at this, I have to be able to, to be the best qualitative producer possible. Like I, I, I I will never succeed and achieve the goals that I have for myself if I'm not able to speak the language of the people I work with, help push them, even from the production standpoint. I mean, their lead is really who helps them level up as, as their individual disciplines. But from a production angle, I see everything, right? Animators, for example, oftentimes just see the character model. They see the animation. And, and we try to keep our people in siloed, of course. That's always the ideal. But there, there is a silo that exists there. And, and even to the lead that there's a, there's, there's a silo. So the producer is the one who comes at it from the broader angle and says, yes, this animation is great within this vacuum that we're talking about, but let's talk about like, you know, our synced, uh, our synced animations, our synced takedowns, and let's start getting engineering involved. And let's talk about how all these systems are going to work together to create an amazing product at an amazing moment for the player. Uh, and again, like that, that was very hard, but I, I was early determined that I was like, the fact that I can't point out these issues and that they don't immediately pop out to me the same way that they do with people who are more experienced in the space is a problem um and and my competitive drive just like i was like i'm gonna watch uh you know gdc talks i'm going to ask questions i'm going to i'm going to do everything i possibly can do to understand why emil for example thinks this way and you know i'm not gonna rest easy until i think like this guy until i'm programmed like this guy and um yeah i mean it just kind of gives you that extra kick in the butt to uh, never take anything for granted and and never get kind of complacent. You you can always learn more. And that was something that Emil taught me like early on. I was like, this guy's like maybe the smartest guy I've ever met. And I watched like week in, week out him just continue to get better. I'm like, crap, if this guy's like still on a path of growth and development, then I got some catching up to do. <laughs> 
That's awesome. That's that, that, that's fun. So, like, I guess when you think about it to the outside world, right? Because part of why people show up on this uh, this this show every once in a while is like, what are the things that I can take away? How can I learn from somebody like Richard? Where you know you've had a very successful AAA release recently. So it's just like, what are some of the things that you believe you know a good producer has? You 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 mentioned a couple of things, right? But like, what are some of the things that you've seen? Because you've worked with some great producers, I'm assuming. You've probably worked with some producers that maybe weren't as great as others. Like, yeah. what would you say is the difference between a great producer and uh, an okay producer? Somebody that just, you know, walks in. To some degree, I think it's going to vary studio by studio, culture to culture. So again, like I, I come from a unique perspective where I can I can really only speak from like what I've learned at Counterplay and what I've been able to extract from talking to others who have come from other studios. But one thing that I think is a little bit unique, I, there, there's a lot of different answers I could give to that, and some of them are pretty stock. So I'll give kind of my more unique, like off the wall answer, uh, which is, you know, getting to, to the best of your ability, getting to know the engine that your developers are working in, or, or just even like in a broader sense, getting to learn a game engine as a producer. Um, I think that's something that kind of slides under the, the radar a little bit. But us being an Unreal Engine studio, I mean, it's easy for me to say that because it is, you know, available to the public for, for free. So anybody can learn Unreal and pick it up. Um, obviously, that isn't the case for every studio and every project, but but Unreal, it, like I mean, it gives a really so, a solid, like it gives fundamentals. And if you learn Unreal, you you could probably learn a lot of other engines at least at a much more expedited pace. Um, I would I would presume, um, you know, example Unity. Um, but but the reason that I you know I, I've had you know a great example of this is we actually have somebody on the Counterplay team now who has introduced me to a mutual friend, and they were kind of in a similar position to me, no industry experience, you know, nothing. It was actually right at the beginning of the pandemic, so they're like, listen. In. I don't like my job now. I want to get into game development. I, I got a lot of free time uh, because the, the state of the world, unfortunately. Uh, what can I do today that maybe six months from now I could get into the industry? And I said, yo, just take like an Unreal course, build some games, build a portfolio. And that was like odd feedback and, and maybe even risky at the time for me to give that to, to somebody, um, you know, three, four years ago. But I was like, just learn the engine, because if you can communicate and speak the language of your team and you understand how your team builds, um, there's a lot they're able to work in a way that's far more nimble because they don't have to worry about translating things for you. They, they, they like, you don't have to be super technical, but knowing like how the pieces kind of come together, how they wire together when you're building the tasks and building the dependencies, it just unlocks you to kind of ask less questions and know more intuitively. Um, so and by how no can we get the engineers and the artists not to like mansplain to you, right? Or gamesplain to you or whatever we want to call it. It's like, how do we not mansplain, gamesplain, art explain, animation explain? Like, how do we avoid that inside it, the engine? It, it, Exactly. And these folks just want to build at the end of the day. Right. So like, I don't think like, like we we're lucky at counterplay that we work with a lot of like great professionals and they have no problem. Like, like, I mean, like I said, in the early days, I have an engineers holding my hand through this stuff. And like, I was very kind of privileged in that sense. I was like, wow, I'm getting to learn from some like really great senior lead level people. Um, um, but, you know, at the end of the day, that is something that can slow them down. It does detract them from building. And if, if producers are able to kind of intuitively navigate that space, um, uh, like whether it be like understanding the engine, understanding Maya for animators, like whatever the case might be. Um, yeah, it just expedites them. And it also gives kind of like an added sense of confidence in that team that they never worry that anything's going to be lost in translation, slip through the cracks or anything like that. So, I mean, just to kind of put a bow on that story, you know, I tell this guy, uh, hey, take a basic Unreal course on Udemy come back to me when you have a portfolio and at the very least I'll like try to introduce you to people who I know. And then I, I can at the very least, like probably get you an interview with, with counterplay um, or at least I'll try my best. And sure enough, like uh, I, I forgot about him because naturally, you know, three, six months go by. He randomly calls me up, shows me his portfolio. He had made a little Pac-Man demo from scratch by himself, a couple of other games, uh, like little mini games. And I was like, yeah, let's get this guy an interview. And now he's like one of our highest performing producers. Um, he, he's also been able to kind of like very quickly build a strong reputation in the in the studio. And when we trust him to do a lot of like uh, like the, the heavy quality qualitative work for us. And, and he's been an absolute rock star. And again, another guy who has absolutely Absolutely no prior industry experience, but uh, just learning the engine and just getting that little technical skill set and then having you know some solid fundamentals as a people person and, and leader um, allowed him to very quickly just jump in and, and get his hands dirty. Well, and you know, I think some people can take away and a go getter, right? So, yeah. so you have two stories in there. One was your story. So I'm sure everyone who's listening is like immediately like emailing Keith and, and hitting him up like you did and bugging give him. Give me free okay. stuff. Yeah, yeah right. give me free stuff. But but you did. You put yourself out there. A lot of people won't do that because, well, it's not going to work. And 
why would I send that email? And I'm not really going to call. I mean, really Mark Cuban or whoever they want to get in touch with, but <laughs> you just took the initiative to, to go do it and probably do it more than once, probably asked a few times and probably were the annoying fly in his ear. But because of it, look at where you're at, right? You can look back in your life and a few of those minor things have turned into a huge career for you. Same thing with, as you mentioned, your buddy where he didn't sit back and then you gave him some advice and he's like, yeah, maybe I'll kind of do a demo. We'll see. He just did it. And he did it in three months later and he showed you a great demo. I'm guessing if we saw the demo, we wouldn't be blown away by it. But in no, reality, yeah. so much of it was the willingness to push himself without getting paid to do it, without needing someone to hold his hand. And he went and did it. And there is that initiative and how important that is. I, I think many people who have become successful would have a similar story of taking that leap of faith, pushing themselves, taking the initiative, not giving up because it didn't work for the first minute or two, but to continue on. Right. And that's, that's your story. That's his story. And because of it, you've, you've uh, become pretty successful. I guess I wanted to shift away from you specifically and into counterplay. So counterplay has, as you said, it was this small indie tiny studio that no one in the world probably knew of. And, puts out this little card game on Duelist, and all of a sudden now Counterplay is a massive studio. Well, massive might be a stretch, but it's a very, very big studio, super successful studio and an awesome place to be and so on. What what do you, if you could look and go, because I do think there's a lot of people here who maybe work at an indie studio with, you know, 15 people and they've got the game and they've got the idea and they're excited and they believe in it, but obviously getting other people to believe in it like, counterplay did with both duelist and then godfall and so on what are if you could try to summarize it into one or two or three things that makes counterplay so special and has mm. created that rise with the exception of of course bringing you on what is it that counterplay does that makes it so awesome who yeah i mean i would have to gas up keith here a little bit because i think i think he's been um uh I mean, he he has absolutely been critical to the growth of the studio. But what I the the way that I would like one thing that first of all, we were always built to be remote, so that that has certainly served us in, in a quite a meaningful way. And what I mean by that is, you know, I, I even remember to give to give Keith credit where credit's deserved. I mean, we even before COVID, before anything, we we had folks working in Australia from the environment team, and I don't know Spain on the anime. I don't know, it was all over the place. Uh, so so we were already built remote and when when covid first struck um keith was i was the first person i knew within my relatively large social circle um who started working from home and i even remember like I, i'm embarrassed by this thought now because now what we like learned in today's like space is kind of a silly thought but i remember i'm like oh is he overreacting because it was like the first us case happened he's like studio shut down everybody work remote you can take your pcs home you take your monitors home whatever you need if you need us to buy you special chairs so you're comfortable at home like we're doing it um and and then we've we've been full remote since then. So the, what I would surmise from that is, you know, a leader who's quick to adapt, who who takes care of his people, who's who's really kind of more on the ground level and never feels like they're kind of in like an ivory tower or anything like that. Um, that 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 was that was huge for us. And, and and so I mean, like, and just overall, like having a very collaborative and safe environment. Um, you know, we had calls where it's you know, the, the character modelers and the, the riggers and, uh, you know, the CEO and producers all in the animation call. And, and we found kind of a structured way to allow us to give like feedback or, or be exposed to all this and, and collaborate in a way where it, it didn't work. Like it feel like where people were working in silos to fact, the fact, despite the fact that we're all at home and we literally are working in like our little box. Um, so, I, I mean, I would have to give, I would have to give that a lot of credit. Um, and, and then obviously, I mean, you already mentioned this, I guess, but, but just having a great product and something to rally around. Around. I, I do feel as though Godfall was was something really special to all of us. It was something that we built from the ground up together, and it, like it, it felt like everybody owned a piece of it. You know, I can point to characters in Godfall, and I'm like, I integrated that character from start to finish. I put the model in, the textures, in the animations. I remember it was two months broken, and Emil came to me. He's like, "Why is this still broken? Please fix this." I'm like, "Oh my god, I got to figure out how to fix this." Uh, like, you know, there, there's and everybody on the team, I think, can do that in a pretty meaningful way um, across all departments. And and I don't know if that's the case at other, not, at least the stories that I hear, that isn't always the case. So that's something a little special about Counterplay, and why I think people stick around and, and kind of fall in love with the space. 
Well, it, again, it's a absolutely beautiful game. I mean, it is, it is really, really cool. The, you know, every component of it is awesome. So yeah, you're right. A great product doesn't exactly hurt. And one of the best I, I, art drops I've ever seen, right? I, I, was, I was going to say, like, in all seriousness, Chris Ha, in my mind, uh, our art director, is top three artist in industry period and it's not world. even like of, of all time world all time all time great yeah. um and i don't think that's an exaggeration and so obviously getting an opportunity to work with like you know the the kobe lebron michael jordan of of, right. of video game art it's like okay yeah you, you, i'll do that that sounds fun <laughs> please so uh chris, you know shout out chris ha i mean um he he's a soft-spoken dude in, in, in some cases but yeah the, like his his greatness can't be overstated well, yeah, for the nine people in the world who haven't played the game, they should play it to see it because it is it is <laughs> really awesome. I mean, it's remarkable when you see some of the art. So I, I would I would agree with that. Um, our anyway, office is filled with some of the art yes, on our walls. Awesome. Yes, That's awesome. Yeah. Actually, yes, I can see the art from where I'm sitting. So, yes, I, I would agree. Um, and I think you make a good point too. maybe set it more with detail, mentioning Chris or Keith or Emil and but there is such an impact in finding a place to be at with a great team, right? Some of these amazing, amazing people that, you know, some people look at, hey, I'm going to go get a job at a gaming studio or whatever. And they look at how much money they make or is it remote or not. But ultimately, I think a lot of their success is going to be derived from who they get to work with. Because when you do get to work with Kobe Bryant, for instance, or you get to work with Michael Jordan or Tom Brady, or, you know, we mentioned athletics because some people get that, you know, analogy. When you get to work with people at that level, not only do you naturally, you know, ride their, ride their coattails to some extent to your success, you also learn a massive amount yeah. from people like that. Even though you're not personally in art, I'm sure just seeing how he operates probably challenges you and inspires you to be a better producer, even though he's on the art side. It's, it, I, I have no doubt that that's the case. It, it absolutely inspires greatness, right? I mean, I, I, I witness what he's doing and I'm like, I mean, it was, I like what I was saying with Emil before, like part of the motivation for me to get better was like, I got to be able to match this guy one day. And I'm just like, at the time, you know, five, six years ago, however long it was at the time, I was like, I'm so far off. I've got so I got my work cut out for me, but it, it was what kept me hungry every step of the way. And, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, just the, the talent pool alone was like <laughs> hard to argue with it. Yeah. Yep. So where's, where's counterplay headed? Like where, where do you see the industry going? What are what is how, when you see how you're going to continue growing there, what's the next release or, you know, how, how is counterplay continuing to grow? Yeah. So, I mean, we've obviously been continuing to work on Godfall. We felt as though there were like still a lot of promises that we wanted to deliver to the community. And luckily we have amazing partners with Gearbox that have been with us every step of the way, identifying what is best for the product, um, what to work on next. And it, it, it's, it's honestly amazing that not only had, did we have our massive uh, like first big expansion, Fire and Darkness, uh, but we also had like some pretty massive, like low key massive free content patches. I know some games do this, but like I'll flex a little bit. I think our content, our free content patches are like, <laughs> they're pretty loaded there's, there's a lot of good stuff in there so um we've you know we, we've just been lucky enough to continue working on that um of course we're always thinking about the future of the studio what comes next how do we take i mean we've scaled up from a team of you know at, at my time probably about 15 to 20 to i don't know the exact head count these days but well over 150 uh fun oh, fact yeah. you know i was in charge of onboarding for like the first three or four years just like the sole producer they're like hey, this is kind of a producer <laughs> thing you can just onboard people teach them how to set up their project um, and welcome them to counterplay you're you're a charming enough guy um so you know i but but i loved that i was actually sad when i gave it up when we actually hired a, like a, a like more admin level person who who did like onboarding correctly i was i was sad to let it go because i loved that i got to meet every single person who came through the doors before they really got to like you know i was their first impression of counterplay and that was that was actually pretty meaningful and important to me um so so i mean now now here we are uh several years later we've scaled up to about 150 or so people and you know it's a matter of of looking at that i mean the talent we have today versus what we had back then is it's almost laughable like what we're able to accomplish is like oh my god i remember when like the, it was like four of us like scraping by trying to figure out how to make combat from scratch and now we've just got this this 
massive team where, where every single person I can point to and explain to you why I think they're like incredibly talented and why I'm so happy we have them. I could literally do that for, for every single person at counterplay. Um, so I think it's just a matter of now of like, okay, we were able to accomplish what we did with Godfall. And for the first several years, we were a small scrappy little team. We've laid this huge foundation um, you know, what's, what's going to come next and what best leverages that talent pool and, and like what, what, where can we like make noise and, and do something really big and special. So we have some ideas, um, obviously kind of all in like some like early, um, um, early stages, but, uh, yeah, I mean, as far as like where I see the industry going, it, it's a great question. I mean, uh, ne next gen gaming, uh, in, in general has been really exciting. I finally just got my PS5, like three months ago <laughs> Christmas my fiance managed it so funny she heard me complaining for like nine months that I couldn't get one and then her first try as a Christmas gift she managed to snag one it made me look like a fool she's like it wasn't that hard I just like went on target and bought it I was like okay, <laughs> okay. me and some of my co-workers have been like like banging our head against that wall so I mean she's oh just, my gosh it was so simple target, target. target. <laughs> she's, she's so stupid talented it's like very frustrating to me sometimes but it's, it's okay um so I I mean yeah I mean I'm excited to see where things develop and and, and when where things go I think there's a lot of exciting opportunity on the horizon I mean I, I don't know if I would pinpoint any one thing is like i think this is the direction we're going um from software continues to up the bar when it comes to greatness when like we look at a game like elden ring been playing a lot of that lately um it's obviously very familiar in, in a lot of ways but um, what's, your, what's your favorite thing of elden ring so far so it's sitting in my living room have not mm -hmm. been, and it's downloaded i've got it yeah. downloaded i've not yeah. actually played yet my favorite thing in elden ring um <laughs> I, I i'm like a meme gamer i like <laughs> I, I, I like I like absurd. I like silly, and I like kind of over the top. So what one of the best for, like like one of the I think literally the first boss maybe or the second boss I ran into was uh, I don't know the full name, but it was Guard Dog basically, and it's this statue it's this cat statue with a sword and it's attack pattern is like pretty repetitive it just like floats up and slams down but it was like so absurd and silly and i mean that's what their boss design is is next to none in a lot of ways and it was just like i got into elden ring i i, I avoided like all spoilers and i was like but i just knew there was a lot of hype and that's like the first boss i'm like oh i feel right at home this is just another great from software game so uh that that was that was like the most memorable uh like nice. moment at least in the early stages um and, and yeah i've been i i've been loving that game Game. Although I will say one other game that I will name drop because internally I'm like uh, annoying everybody who will listen to me. And I went like on a tweet storm about it last night. Uh, Stranger of pa Paradise, the Final Fantasy origin game, uh, kind of got like memed on because of the chaos trailer they had dropped a little while back. Where it's like, I'm here to kill chaos. I'm going to kill chaos. And they said chaos like 40 times in the trailer. Uh, and everybody's like, that's kind of silly. Um, I, and I, like I... I, I played the demo last night and I love the game. And actually what I, part of what I love about it is it actually feels very familiar to Godfall. A lot of people are kind of saying, Oh, it's like dark souls meets final fantasy, which is like true in some ways, but uh, it, it, it feels like playing Godfall in some ways. And I, and I love that because I'm a huge final fantasy fan. I have been forever. So to see, I don't know if Godfall influenced the building of this game at all. Maybe it did. Maybe it didn't. Oh, it did. It definitely did. We'll see. It what right was here. the name again? Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, the, the title has also been kind of memed a little bit. So it is Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin. And it's the it's the story of Garland, if you're familiar with him in the original Final Fantasy. It's, it's his origin story as a, as a villain. And the dialogue... Oh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a, fa a Final Fantasy nut job, like a little oh, bit. Dude, I am, yeah. Just, just don't go in. Like I, I think it's a game that genuinely doesn't... I haven't seen reviews. I don't know what the opinion is. I don't know what developers are saying. So I, I might very well be miscapturing this and just giving my very biased interpretation. But it's a game that doesn't take itself too serious. It's like way hyper masculine for no reason and it's so i was just cracking up but in like the best way possible and enjoying like the moment to moment the combat's actually really fun it's a looter it's got some like traces of godfall that feel familiar and i was just like it was so funny because my fiance comes out and i'm playing it and she was like she knew what it was she was like knew me she's like oh you're, you're playing the chaos game and i'm like it's my game of the year over elden ring and and it was like but it, it, it isn't actually it isn't actually but like if you're telling me what experience is warming my heart the most and making me feel like a kid again um I, i'd actually give like a slight edge to the demo because it's just like <sighs> i don't know i'm a bit of a gaming hipster when it comes to some of this <laughs> stuff and uh yeah there's just something really special and spectacular about at least the first 30 minutes i can't speak to anything else beyond that but i've been i've been enjoying that one so so to get I, again i guess we're gonna kind of move into like some personal stuff right so you you work on game all day yeah and then 
you turn off work and you go play games. Do you ever get that time where you're like, I need a break. I just need a break from games. I got to go for a run. I need to get Yeah, like on the side with the fiance, they go judge games, gamers. They go judge gamers. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. yeah. Then she's in esports, right? So it's like we're basically the ultimate gaming like power couple household i guess but oh, you're like a jennifer Jen, whatever the but in the gaming space right 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 um um so i mean yeah yeah like i meditate uh we're very into uh physical fitness so like we work out four or five times uh, a week uh do do meditation most mornings um um, we have two awesome Australian Shepherd dogs, so they keep us busy. Very high energy. Uh, Loki, who's nine months old, um, and Keanu, who's about to turn five. So, so yeah, I definitely have hobbies outside. I actually have started very secretly. Um, not that I would ever share this or expose it to the world. It's very under wraps. But I've also started fulfilling my my music career dream, and I've started recording some music just for fun. Um, so I definitely think it's important to find things that stimulate me outside of video games. Uh, not that I ever get burnt out necessarily. Like you it's not like I have to go on stage one day with him, where you're going to play some music while he jams out and does no, a DJ but, session. I, I think I think the music thing is going to be one of those things that forever. It's like my little diary. It's like my uh, it's like my little space of just because uh, I've always music has been my second passion next to video games and both i always felt like i had missed the boat on right because i had a degree in creative writing and then a master's in communication i was like that's not going to get me either one of those things so um so uh you know like i always felt like i missed the boat um in the early stages of my life on both gaming and music and it made me sad and then obviously i've had an awesome opportunity to to get into gaming and um that was that was awesome um but but music was the one up until this point that i never got to fully pursue and so recently that's like my break away from gaming if i if i don't feel like gaming if i'm feeling that night if i'm a little like tired from development uh i'm just like well let's go let's go record some music and make some goofy sounds see what behind the scenes both jamie and maddie messaged us while you're speaking saying if he needs somebody to produce it we can do that they 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 do music production on the side They, they have a little side hustle doing music production that, that's amazing. No, I might, I might, I might need to take y'all up on that. Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not particularly good. I'm, I'm a little goofy and rough around the edges, but it's, uh, it's fun. But, but yeah. So, but like at the end of the day, I mean, I do love gaming, uh, with my whole heart and soul. So, um, I like, I, I do take those breaks, but they're, they're, they're few and far between to some degree because I. I just love getting better at what I do and I, I love doing what I do. So it's uh, like, it, it's good to know how to disconnect to avoid burnout. Cause I understand how real that is. And got to have that, a passion on the side, man. Got yeah, it. exactly. You, you have to. And I learned that lesson very early on, but, um, but I'm lucky enough that it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's very hard to burn out on gaming. Cause it's such a fun thing to do. <laughs> and there's a lot of different avenues you can take gaming to. Some right. are more serious, some are more lighthearted and so on. And I will say, if you ever want to just, Take a breather. You come out here to Nashville. We got plenty of live music. Oh, love Maddie Nashville. And Jamie yeah. can take it all the different spots around here or Shane. Spent four years in Kentucky, Western Kentucky University. That's where I got my creative writing degree and not much to do in Bowling Green, Kentucky. So and also an hour an airport. Half. So we, yeah, we always went to Nashville. That was our airport. That was our, our bar. That was our, our club, everything. So yeah, love, love Nashville. Love the music scene out there. I've been to the country music hall of fame a couple of times as well, I believe. All right, so where are you from originally? Uh, South Florida, a town called Sunrise, about 30 minutes north of Miami. All right, so, but then you went to school in Western Kentucky and Illinois State. Mm -hmm. Yeah, worked my way. Now you live in LA. Yeah. What's the best, what's the best of those places to live? Give us your, uh, would you ever move back to Florida or no? I thought that for a while until I got to LA because I was also in San Francisco, uh, well, Emeryville for two years. I before I moved from Illinois to San Francisco, then most recently LA uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, I, I do really like Florida; holds a fond place in my heart. But now that I'm in LA, LA just feels like more expensive Florida, which I hate that side of it. But <laughs> because, because Gabby's on air, we'll, we'll always probably be out here at least at least in like the near to me. Got it. Future. So that's a big part of it is she's in that entertainment world which is exactly. really by and large and unless you're in music which can you can argue nashville it's really in la maybe new york but primarily la exactly but i love la in the sense that it's it's so it's so familiar to home it feels like florida the only thing i miss is the random rain showers you know florida 
can be bright and sunny, not a cloud in the sky. <laughs> it just starts raining. It's like, how the hell is this happening? But I love that. I love the rain. It's very soothing, very relaxing. It's not even rain. It's like you're getting. I don't like, know what it is. Yeah, dump a like, water dump. Like you could, you could canoe. Oh yeah, I, I I have memories in my childhood walking home from elementary school because there was a flash flood and like you know our water's up to our knees and they're like, be careful of snakes and alligators. I'm like, I'm a seven year old <laughs> child. I'll try my best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, ha- I have two miles to get home. Do. We'll see. What happens? Yeah, appreciate the warning. I don't think I'm. I stand much defense against either of those. No. All right. Last question. Okay. Last question. Favorite movie? You're in the entertainment space. You better have a good one. Yeah, actually, you, it's it's hard to see. Oop, it's the no, this one. So I have a signed copy of Fight Club from Chuck Palahniuk right back nice. there, and Fight Club oh. is absolutely my favorite movie of all time. Yeah, actually, yeah. it's it's both my fiance and I's favorite movie, and it was something like, we learned about. How each you other know you're meant to be? Uh, honestly, like basically, uh, <laughs> yeah. What's, I mean, we, rule one of marriage, right? Yeah, What's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never, talk, never talk about marriage. That's why we've been engaged for like three years. Uh, <laughs> no, it's actually the pandemic's fault. But but no, we actually joke that we want like it would be great if Chuck Palahniuk would officiate our wedding. So hey, Chuck Palahniuk, if you're if you're cool. listening, man, hey, like come on, let's let's make this happen. We'll, we'll, we will definitely tag him. Yeah, one hundred percent tag him, please, and please you are going to have him officiate your wedding. That's that's our dream. I'm just gonna leverage. I mean, she's the much cooler one, right? She's like the one who's verified and has like a following and stuff. So we're gonna we're gonna leverage that and be like, hey man, come on, yes. like, we love you. We're like you you, you made this union happen. It with your, a tweet or two. Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, but I've I've read every book by Chuck Palahniuk that he's ever written, every short story, even the gruesome ones coming straight out of Playboy magazine. And yeah, Fight Club. I wish there were more movies based on his writing because I think he's just second to none in my mind and uh yeah fight club is like and i love in interviews that he says chuck polonick says uh that the movie is much better than the book that's like such a like how have you ever heard that from, never like, ever, ever never anywhere else oh, only chuck polonick and and man like i said i got like weird taste i got like this like weird hipster vibe sometimes with stuff and polonick just knows how to feed into it so he's yeah that that would be my favorite movie that's, that's awesome so right now chuck you are on the clock. We need a yes that you are going to officiate their wedding. 100%. That would be awesome. I would love that that would be a podcast first if we were able to pull that off. Um, but, and I will say that was an awesome movie. And it well, is, is an awesome movie. Um, super unique too, which, you know, in the last 15, 20 years, we haven't, it's all been, you know, sequels or remakes. That's one of those that yeah, please don't remake it. Just leave it the way it was. It was awesome. It is awesome. Yeah. Fight Club, well done. You just got judged and you got an A plus with that answer. That was good. <laughs> and I, not a lot of people bring that one up and they should because Fight Club certainly on most people's list should be a top 20 movie or whatever, regardless it, of your taste. It, they were smart with how they did it too. It, it aged extremely well. The like, you know, the development in, in tech and VFX and all this other stuff doesn't really, it's not a hindrance to, to them at all. It doesn't feel super dated at this point i mean maybe it's starting to i guess but i, I don't know i think it's aged extremely well and, and to your point like yeah don't remake it it's it's perfect don't touch it ed norton one of my favorite actors of all time and that was one of his like, if you do remake it wait till i die <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah yeah that was one of ed norton's really first blockbusters right or i mean he had done american history acts prior mm-hmm. to it i think yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and then fight club I, I think and then he really took off i mean maybe i'm I, i'm getting dates wrong a little bit and who was the female lead in that? Oh, um, 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 uh, she's got such a good name. Um, oh no. Well, here That's we such go. Such a unique face too. Yeah. Why, I mean, she's amazing. She's amazing Thurman. in Sweeney Todd and, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. I'm looking the cast up on the side here because I refuse to not, uh, Hella, Helena Bonham Carter. Yes. Thank you. Yes. yes. And, and, and she took off from that movie. That was a bit, that was her real start. I think. Yeah. And I mean, you like, I mean, that cast is so, I mean, you also had Jared Leto in there. That was like an early stage Jared Leto film. Um, he was angel face and, and then, I mean, rest in peace, but meatloaf was awesome in that too. I mean, and then obviously Brad Pitt, I would have to like also uh, sure. call, call him out cause he's obviously, but yeah, I mean, cr- crazy good cast. Yeah, I, I mean, you don't get better than fight club. There's no, just... I might watch fight club tonight. Yeah. I, I, I would recommend know, it. My wife and kids Definitely are out of town for the first time ever. I have two days where they are visiting the in-laws and I have nothing to do this first time ever in my life. Maybe you start I, a fight club. Who knows? I, yeah. Th- yes. Instead it. of watching fight club, I will start a fight club tonight. 
if, if, if you have like a band-aid over your uh, eyebrow <laughs> and the next Monday, we'll know why. Yeah. Got a big black guy. Yeah. All right. Well, Richard, this was awesome. I totally appreciate you taking your time. Again, again Richard Hain, lead producer for Counterplay Games. I would say the greatest gaming studio. Check out Godfall, arguably the greatest art in any game. Um, it, it, an awesome story. Thank you so much for joining us. And I really hope everyone has just took some of the advice even as to taking the initiative, email the crap out of Keith. Just kidding. But taking the initiative, <laughs> pushing, pushing yourself to put yourself out there. And because of it, is that a hugely successful career in your personal number one passion in life, which is really cool to hear that. Um, this was a lot of fun. Go Redbirds, right? Illinois State Redbirds. Go, go Redbirds. Go Big Red. You know what it is. And yeah, thank you, Taylor and Shane, for having me. Absolute pleasure. And um, yeah, I'm always I'm always happy to jam on gaming and, and all things gaming. So thanks for having me. And we need an answer soon, Chuck. I'm just saying. Yeah, seriously. You're on, you're on the clock. <laughs> so Richard, again, thank you. Press su subscribe, like, or whatever it is to this uh, YouTube. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of days. Next day.